Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on another exciting workshop hosted by us here at Circuit Stream. Now, before I do continue on, I want to be sure that you can all hear me and see me. So if you can let me know in the chat, just to the right of the screen, can you all hear me and see me? I'd hate to continue on uh, without anyone being able to, to hear me. I see Brian here, all good, and both hear and see. Wonderful. Michael, Ariana, yes, great. Thank you for letting me all know. Now, with all of our workshops and webinars, we tend to have people joining us from all over the world. So I'd love to ask you all currently in attendance, where are you tuning in from? Let me know in the chat whereabouts you're located. I have Muad here from Morocco and from the Netherlands, Marcus from Germany. We have Charmette, uh, Jose, Brian from Vancouver, uh, Michael from Vancouver as well, Yusuf from Morocco and Minas from Greece, Mert from Turkey. So people from all over the world again, some Canadians here as well, and Americans. Great to have you all with us. I myself am located in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Circus Stream is headquartered out of Calgary, but we have colleagues located all over the world. And in the chat here, you'll see my colleague, Kyle. He's part of the educational team. He's based out of Toronto, Ontario, in Canada. But we have colleagues located all over. Now, before we dive into to this workshop and webinar, a few things that I wanted to highlight and outline. So to the right, as you have all seen, there is a chat box. Feel free to chat amongst yourselves, uh, add any comments that you would like, and, and any questions. However, for those questions that you would really like to have answered, please toss them into the questions tab. There's a tab beside the chat tab there. It's called questions tab. Toss any questions you have around VR, AR, Unity, Mars, Circuit Stream, really anything, and we would be more than happy to help answer those for you. It, the questions tab allows us to really track what hasn't been answered. We do have a in-depth Q&A session at the very end of this workshop and webinar. We'll answer some questions throughout as well, but if we do need to bring in one of our specialists like Jerry to answer some more advanced questions, we'll most likely keep those questions to the end of the workshop here. Uh, beside the questions tab, you'll also notice a polls tab. And I'll be tossing out polls throughout this presentation just to gauge the experience of the audience here today. And as an example, I'm going to toss in a poll right now. And just out of curiosity, uh, what industry are you interested in potentially applying VR or AR or Unity Mars to? So I did just toss in a poll as an example of what that would look like. Feel free to go to the polls tab to check out. Uh, let us know what industry are you potentially looking to apply this to? I see a lot of film, architecture, some gaming, construction, training, other design, UI, UX. So a lot of different industries here looking to apply this technology. Now, without further ado, let's get going here with this. Uh, before we, we continue on, you know, what is Unity Mars? Now, Unity Mars is a tool that AR content creators use to really streamline a lot of the activities they're doing. So for those of you who are new to Unity, new to VR and AR, this may seem a little advanced for you. However, if you are new to this area and field and you're looking to dive into AR and VR later on, this is a great tool for you to keep in mind for future work. So again, if you're a beginner here, it may seem a little advanced, but no worries. Sit back, relax, ask any questions around this, and you can use this to then apply to your future AR content creation work. But I'm going to share a video here about introducing Unity Mars, just so you can all get a better idea, an introduction to what Unity Mars is for those of you who may have never heard about it. So I'm going to play the video. It's about a minute, minute 15 long, and then I'll be right back. experiences that interact intelligently with the real world at any location and with any type of data. We need to visualize a place or a product, create a unique experience for an event, train up your staff, no problem. Imagine the possibilities as you author for games, sales, marketing, and more. 
for any device or hardware platform. With Unity Mars, you can quickly capture and assemble real-world assets, like locations, objects, and props. Then, just drag and drop them and test on the fly, all without leaving the Unity Editor. Unity Mars experiences are powerful, interactive, and intelligent. Build once and deploy on any AR-enabled device. Get Unity Mars now and shape the world. Woo! You need a Mars, baby! Well, let's skip this again. Uh, hey, thanks for letting me know, Cal, that there was no audio in the beginning there. My apologies, everyone. If you do need this video, we will share it in the comments section here and to you all after this workshop ends. But it is a great introduction to what Unity Mars is and how you can potentially use it. Now, what's the agenda today? So I myself will be introducing you all to who we are and what we do here at Circus Stream. That'll take about 10 minutes, if that. Now, then I'll be inviting my colleague Jerry onto the stage here to do a Unity Mars deep dive. And he's really going to be showing you how to get this Unity Mars going, how to apply it to your projects, and all the cool features that are related to it. Now, after Jerry's technical bit going into Unity Mars, uh, we're going to wrap things up, offer some resources. That'll take about five, 10 minutes. And then we'll open it up for our live QA session. 15 minutes long, maybe up to 30 minutes, really depends on how many questions we have in that questions tab by the end there. Now, this workshop and webinar will be recorded. So for those of you who are located abroad in Turkey, Greece, wherever it may be, if you do need to hop off for dinner, go to bed, maybe even wake up in the morning, depending on where you're located, we will send you this recording for you to review at your own time. We will also send any files and resources that we do and work with here on the workshop and webinar and this will be emailed to you all as well as soon as we wrap things up today. But let's get into who we are and what we do here at Circus Stream. So I myself am Stefan, and I am part of the education team here at Circus Stream. I have over seven years of experience in the tech industry, working with travel IT companies, learning management system providers, business integration in ERP platforms, and now in the lovely world of XR, AR, VR, and MR. A little fun fact about myself, and I'm sure David here in the chat, you've heard a lot about it. I was a member of Water Polo Canada way back in the day. I trained with the 2008 Beijing Olympic team. Never attended the Olympics, but heard lots of great stories, and it was a great experience for young old Steph back in the day. Now, today I will be joined by Jerry Medeiros, and Jerry is our head of education here at Circus Stream. He has over 10 years of industry experience and a games technology and interaction design background in his education, master of science in, in computer science there as well. Now, who we are Circus Stream? So Circus Stream was founded in 2015 and we recognize that the technology changes every year. And instead of diving into creating cool content and adding it to different stores and publishing them, we noticed the gap in actually helping people learn how to use some of these tools or create their own experiences, whether it's VR or AR, and, and really to help them implement it, create these projects and to learn more about it. And since 2015, we've trained over 30,000 people in how to use this technology, how to develop for it, implement it and manage them. We're a team of about 20 people located all over the world, mainly in North America and in South America, but we do have colleagues in Europe and Asia as well. Now, Circus Stream is a Unity channel partner and authorized training provider. And partners are approved based on their expertise, focus on quality education, and commitment to providing the highest level of training available. Now, there's two big things that we really do here at Circus Stream. And the first is education and training, what we've been doing the last several years since 2015. And these are just some of the companies and professionals that we've had the pleasure to have in our programs, help them learn how to create VR and AR experiences, whether to create their own ideas and projects, bring it back to their workplaces to get buy-in, or to create future content for their work and organizations there. So various post-secondary institutions, uh, companies like BMW, Walmart, Autodesk, Microsoft, and Facebook, absolute pleasure having everyone from all walks of life 
join us to learn more about this exciting technology. Now, how do we do this? Well, we have two main courses. We have our XR Development with Unity program. This is more so a beginner and intermediate friendly course for those looking to dive into this, learn to create their own experiences. It's 10 weeks long, four hours per week. The next course we have available to register to is on April 27th. And I'll touch up on that later on as well. Now, we also have a live and online XR Project Accelerator course. For those of you who are already more familiar with Unity, C Sharp, creating VR and AR content, really giving you uh, the resources and private sessions to accelerate your ideas and projects together, going into more in-depth and advanced content with the learners. Now, um, what differentiates us from some of the other providers out there? Well, it's really the one-on-one -on -one support and mentorship that comes bundled with our courses, where you come in with your own idea, your own project that you want to get going with to create or to continue working on. And you get weekly one-on-one -on -one support, private meetings to build out your ideas, get support, and develop your project alongside our instructors, mentors, and developers. Now, we have a couple of individual short courses available as well for those who might want to just focus on one thing at first and then dive into something else later on. And those two courses that we have are the C-Sharp Scripting Fundamentals in Unity. Unity uses C-Sharp coding to optimize and, and really work on those projects to make them seem real. And then we have our Introduction to XR Design course. And this is really going into the design principles, audio, sound, um, you know, feeling and whatnot in these experiences. So really going into the design aspects that you can then take and touch up on the projects that you're working on or will be working on. Now, the second thing that we do here at Circus Stream alongside education and training has been content creation and consultation, where we've helped support several and various companies build content for them that they can then apply to their work or bringing them on calls with myself or my colleague, Kyle, to help shed some light and insight on how they can work with this technology and what steps do they need to take to actually bring this to life. But now that you've learned a little bit about us and what we're about here at Circuit Stream, what are you going to learn today? Well, today we'll be going into the, a fundamental understanding of implementing Unity Mars to upgrade and accelerate your AR development. We'll be covering best practices of using Unity Mars, knowledge about new features of Mars and how to use them in your projects, as well as techniques on how to quickly reiterate and test your AR projects while developing. Now I'm gonna toss in a poll here as, as with all of our workshops and webinars, just to gauge the experience of the audience. So I'm publishing the poll right now, and if you could let me know, how much Unity experience do you have on a scale of zero to 10? Zero being I've never heard of Unity, I'm new to Unity. Uh, 10 being that you're a Jedi master and Chuck Norris of Unity, that you've already worked on stuff, you can teach our courses, you're a certified professional. So it looks like we have uh, you know, a few beginners, a uh, few of more advanced learners here. It looks like we have more advanced learners than we do have beginners here. So. With this, again, if you are a beginner, this may seem a little advanced for you, but it's a great tool to keep in mind for future development. Again, sit back, relax, ask any questions that come to mind, and we'd be happy to shed more light on those for you. Now, if you're an advanced learner in Unity, uh, this is a great tool to really help streamline your future AR projects, and we love to show you more about it. But for those of you who marked yourselves as a, you know, a one, or, or a two maybe. What is Unity? Well, Unity is a free 3D development engine for building games, simulations, and experiences. It's the easiest way to begin making apps for XR. Now, XR is an umbrella term. It stands for extended reality, which covers both, or I guess all three, augmented reality, AR, virtual reality, VR, and mixed reality, MR. It's just a nice simple term to really cover the entire industry here. But how does one actually go about creating their own AR project or actually using Unity Mars later on? Well, you have an idea and you bring that idea into a creation engine like Unity. 
That's where you work on your project, you develop it, you use C Sharp to optimize it. And then once it's kind of finished up and ready to go, you push it out to an SDK, which then pushes it out to the relevant device that you are hoping to build it for. So Android devices, uh, Apple or iOS devices, the HoloLens, a Magic Leap headset, um, really any device you're looking to push out an AR experience for, that's what this content or the workflow would look like. Idea into a creation engine, out to an SDK, and then into the headsets that you would like to create it for. But I'm gonna toss in another poll here since we're on the topic of headsets. What devices do you own? And I, I know I'm missing a few devices on this list here, but I just published the poll. If you go to the polls tab, let me know what device you own. I myself have the first version of the Oculus. I'm looking to get the Oculus Quest 2 or 3 coming out here shortly. I've also got my own Android phone, but looking at the responses, lots of people owning the Quest, Android and iPhones, which makes sense. Most people have a mobile phone. Uh, Oculus Go, one that was discontinued a while back. Uh, other none, HoloLens, HTC Vive, and the Rift. We've got a Pro as well. No Valve indexes, the, the Lambo of, of VR headsets, but no worries. Thank you for, uh, for letting me know there. So today is an introduction to Unity Mars, workflows and new features. And I'd love to invite Jerry Medeiros onto the stage here. It is an honor and a pleasure to have Jerry join us, our head of education, to cover Unity Mars with you all. How to use it, how to work with it, how to implement it. And just briefly, before we do get into Jerry's part here, Telling you a little bit more about Unity Mars. If, if you missed that video in the beginning or those few, first few seconds cut off, Unity Mars provides augmented reality creators everywhere with specialized tools and a streamlined workflow to deliver responsive location-aware AR experiences into the user's hands. It's the world's first authoring solution that brings real-world environment and sensor data into a creative workflow. So that means that you can build quickly, really quickly build mixed and augmented reality experiences that are context aware, responsive to physical spaces as well. And they will work in any location with any type of data. But I'm going to pass the torch off here to Jerry. Jerry, great seeing you. Thank you so much for joining us. If you do have any questions, uh, David, great question in the chat there. Please do toss them into the questions tab. Kyle or I will be answering any questions throughout, any questions that we can. We'll leave some of the more in-depth ones to the very end. But Jerry, thank you again for joining us. And uh, I'll be back in about 30, 45 minutes here to wrap everything up. All right, great Steph, thank you for the intro. Uh, how is everyone doing? Can you guys hear me and see me just well? Is it working? i will fine, great, All right. So welcome everyone. Well, uh, Steph did a pretty good job in there introducing what Mars is, but I will share a little bit of context here so we understand why this thing is great, why it's important, and why I like a lot to talk about Mars. So, uh, if you uh, can, you guys see the the presentation here. Is it just fine? Is it too small? How is it there? Oh, good. Great, great, great. Sometimes it just becomes like super, super small and I don't know why. So I'm glad it's working. Cool. So if you are a complete, complete beginner to this and you have never developed, uh, developed anything AR in your entire life, let me start from the beginning. So I'm not sure if everyone, like uh, Steph gave like a really good introduction about the XR workspace and what those things are uh, and why we have like so many uh, letters in this thing like AR, VR, MR, and so on and so forth. So what we consider AR is anything where the real world is what matters. So in this uh, workspace, like when we have VR, AR and everything, we're gonna be considering AR, uh, any application that the real world really matters. It's not only the real world, we need to overlay something that is digital in there, but most of the things are real world. So I'm gonna be seeing through the camera or seeing through the glasses, something like that. Uh, the majority of what exists. So I will look into my room in here, or I'm gonna walk in the street and see the street. And then we have like a couple of uh, digital content that is added on top of that thing. We have a couple of different applications for that. So in training, for example, people 
just have like Oculuses and they look into a machine and they learn how to operate that machine. Or if you want to decorate your house, for example, you can download the Ikea app and see how that chair is going to look into your, into your room or into your uh, living room, something like that. So basically, uh, we have lots of applications, but again, something, the reward must be there. We have uh, basically like two categories. It can be a headset, which most of the times is the most expensive one. We don't have like lots of headsets out there. Uh, we had like the Google Glass that people didn't use that much. Now we have the HoloLens, Magic Leap and all those things. So the headset, it's basically like, uh, it can be translucent or transparent, but basically I can see uh, the world and I have like a camera or any technology that uh, allows me to add computer graphics on top of that. But I don't need to hold anything. So it's like more comfortable. It's a little bit more powerful, but it's more expensive. So most of the times, if you want to create an application to reach a large audience, that's not going to be your approach. You're going to go to the other side, which is the handheld. So the handheld is basically uh, built on top of a mobile device. So it can be, for example, an Android or an iPhone. And the better they are, the better the experiences are as well. Like if you have a Node phone, maybe you don't even have the possibility to have AR in there. But if you have like a new Android phone or a more modern iPhone, you're going to have like lots of sensors, good cameras, and then you are able to use the cameras to, to capture the world and overlay something in real time. So this is just basically an intro to, to what AR is. And then inside of that, we have a couple of ways of interacting with the real world. So the simplest one is using a marker. Basically, in order to interact with the real world, I'm going to print something and add that. So it can be like a QR code, it can be a business card, it can be a photograph or something like that. We're going to call that an image marker. So basically, we point our device, be it the handheld or be the headset, to that marker. And then we recognize that image and place the 3D object on top of that. So the, there are good and bad things about this approach. The good thing is that uh, it's simpler, like it doesn't rely on any sensors on the mobile device, just the image recognition. So even if a very, very simple mobile phone, you can actually do it. So it's basically recognize the image, place something on top of the image. The bad thing about this is, well, you need to have this marker. Sometimes it's not possible. Like if I am uh, teaching people how to fix an airplane, for example, I don't want to to place like stickers or image to the airplane. That doesn't make sense. So in some scenarios, uh, we cannot add that. Like it's not, it's not a possibility, but if that's something that you can do, that's like the simplest approach. It's going to work with the majority of the devices out there. And then we have the location base. So this is based on the GPS and other sensors as well, but it's going to detect where I am, uh, based on my GPS and, and place an object in there. Uh, so there's this example of Pokemon Go here. It, it uses not only this technique, but other ones as well. But this is the final location base. So a couple of Pokemons, they only appear in specific countries and things like that. So it knows where I am and it plays things based on where I am uh, in the real world. And then we have the most interesting ones, uh, which are the markless. So those ones, they are not going to be relying on any tracker, like on any image tracker or GPS tracker. It's going to be uh, analyzing the world in different ways, the world in different ways, and placing the objects in there. So with simpler phones, it's going to use uh, only the image tracking, like the, the image of the camera, and try to find planes. So you know, for example, if this is a uh, horizontal plane, so I know that this is the floor or a table or a vertical plane. So it's going to be uh, the wall or something like that. Uh, most of the applications that we have nowadays, they work this way. They detect planes and they place things on top of, of planes. And with more modern technologies, we can have like uh, better detections, not only planes, but surfaces. But then it becomes a little, more, uh, a little bit more complex and not every single device is going to be able to do that. So if you have a HoloLens, for example, you see that it actually can recognize and map the entire surface, even though it's curved, even though it's not uh, just the plane. But that's more limited. So yeah, we need to take into consideration what our users are going to have, what's the precision that we need, and then we can use one of those three techniques in there. And then when we are developing for AR, we have lots of challenges. Like developing AR is something complex. The first thing is I don't know where the, uh, the user is going to be using it. So if I define, for example, that 
there needs to be a table in there, but maybe my user doesn't have any table. So what I'm gonna do in this in, in, the, in this scenario, or maybe he has like two tables. So how I'm gonna decide if I place the Pokemon on top of one table or the other. So the real world is like, it's, it's complex. There are lots of things in there. Those things changes. People are gonna be using this in different scenarios. And it's, it's quite hard to define the variables and to understand uh, how the word looks like and what we want to do there, like where we want to place these things. And also uh, the second point, it's super hard to test our experiences because we need to build and then we go there. Say for example, you were making an application for a museum. People are going to be using that in a museum. So to be 100% sure that everything works, you need to go to the museum and test that. And well, if I need to go there every single, for every single change that I made in my application, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm not never gonna finish that. So those are like the 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 first pain points that we have while developing AR. And the text. And the third one is uh, we already know that we are dealing with planes, and I want to make uh, a, an application in a way that it looks like my digital content is inserted into the the virtual. It, my virtual content is inserted in the real world. So I need them to be merged in a way that they interact in a good way. But that's not simple. If I have the table, for example, well, I would be able to uh, to make my character fall from the table on the floor. So uh, making that interaction in a way that it's seamless, it, it's complex. There are, there are many variables in there. So in this scenario, we have the Unity Mars. Steph introduced that like in a brilliant way. Uh, I'm not gonna spend that much time in this, but basically what Mars is, is like an environment. So it's an environment with lots of tools inside of the Unity editor that makes it easier for us to create, test, and deliver intelligent AR experiences. And when we say intelligent, it's because I don't need to pre I don't need to predict every single uh, condition of the real world. I don't need to pre uh, to predict like every single uh, variable. Uh, I can define like some fuzziness. I can add a couple of rules, and then it's gonna play by year, like say, seeing what is uh, what is in there and trying to make the best decisions. And then uh, I, I listed like three pain points and then we have three things that uh, Unity Mars is gonna solve for us, not necessarily solve, but at least like alleviate. The first one is there is this visual workflow to create content. So I don't need to uh, program every single interaction, detect every single table and all of those things. I can basically just uh, uh, define like the boundaries, how I, 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 I want things to happen. What are the limitations? Like, I don't want this to happen never. These I want to happen sometimes. So we can like define in something that is more close to natural language. And it's going to do that for us. We can test it in multiple conditions. And that's really good. Like if I want to test my app in a museum, as I said, I can go to the museum or I can use a 3d model of the museum inside of the Unity Editor and, and see how it's gonna behave. Like it's not exactly the same uh, environment, but it's real close to that. So we can uh, use presets like a room, a kitchen, maybe a museum, a factory, uh, a factory and see how those things, uh, how my application is gonna behave in, the, in those things, in, in those environments. And then we have the third one, which is making things interact with the real world. So we have like a couple of, they call it forces like conditions. So I say, for example, if an object already exists in this space, well, don't play something else there. Just pad it a little bit, just shift it a little bit. So they are not on top of each other and we don't need to code those interactions. So today I'm going to be showing you guys Unity Mars and we are not going to write a single line of code. We're going to be playing only with uh, the work the visual workflows in there. Another thing that I like a lot about Mars is that it's built on top of the Unity XR stack. So if you were already familiar with any other thing in the uh, XR stack, you're gonna understand Mars a little bit better. So we have like lots of different technologies, right? So we have the Magic Leap, we have the uh, HoloLens, Android, iOS, all of those, inf uh, all of those uh, devices and platforms, they support AR in a way. So instead of having to develop for every single platform, if we're using the Unity XR stack, we only write our application once using the developer tool. So in our case here is gonna be Mars that uses AR Foundation and AR Foundation is an abstraction for the subsystems. So I don't need to know exactly how face tracking works in the device. Uh, I don't need to know exactly how to acquire image from the camera because AR Foundation knows that uh, based on whether this is iOS or Android. 
and then I just need to use the Earth Foundation, or in our case, use Mars. Mars, like a, Mars, is basically a visual workflow for AR Foundation, because in AR Foundation we need to code everything. In Mars, we don't. We just need to use the interface, and it's gonna use the codes in AR Foundation that uses the subsystems, and then the subsystems communicate with the device based on the plugins. So in the future, if Apple, for example, by the end of this year, uh, releases a new platform, this is gonna work. Like if they release the glasses, the goggles they, they're promising, we don't need to change uh, our implementation. We just need to add a new uh, native plugin there that it's gonna just plug to uh, everything else that uh, exists in the Unity XR stack. So that's it. Uh, another thing that I'm gonna be showing you guys today is the Unity Companion app. This is an app that we install on the phone to uh, track the environment and to capture real world uh, information like proxies and, and, and well, we're gonna be seeing what is possible to do with that. It is in beta, so you need to just release that thing. It's super, super new. And you guys can test that if you want to, even though you don't, ha you don't have a subscription for Mars. There are a couple of limitations, like you're not gonna be able to sync that with the cloud and to test that in the editor, but you can play around with the app and see how powerful this thing is. And you can actually see how powerful your device is because it's gonna show you what uh, that specific device is, is showing in terms of planes and other features. So that's it. Let's see in the editor how this thing works. Before I uh, go to the editor here, let me see if everything is going fine. Sure, sure. Yeah, you're gonna receive the, the, the recording. If you have any question, just place that in the questions tab and I'm gonna look into that uh, in a while as well. So let me share my entire screen here so you guys can see Unity. All right, so this is my Unity editor and now I'm not seeing anyone. I only have one screen, so I'm sorry if uh, if you said something and I don't reply immediately, I'm gonna reply everything in a couple of minutes. All right, so I do have Unity here and I installed Mars already because it takes some time. So you guys are gonna receive the link for testing Mars. Uh, Mars is not a free tool, but you have like 45 days to trial to see how it works and everything. And if you like it, maybe, uh, and if it's like for you, you can maybe uh, subscribe for it. So uh, I'm not gonna show how to install it because it's just basically clicking a bunch of buttons, but you're gonna receive the instructions after so you can play with that yourself. So I have Unity here. If you have never seen Unity before, this is how it looks like. Uh, we have a bunch of different tabs here. Uh, each one of those tabs, they serve a different purpose. On the, the most important ones in our case are the hierarchy and the scene. So the hierarchy is basically every single object that exists in my, in my project, in my scene, they're gonna be here. So if I have a camera, a light, a 3D character, anything, we're just gonna add that here. And the scene view is basically the same. So every single thing that exists in the hierarchy is gonna be in the scene as well, in the scene as well. But in the scene, it's easier to see because it's basically like our virtual world here. So we just see and we can move things around. So I'm moving the light, I'm moving the camera. So this is the scene. On the right here, I have the inspector. So the inspector is where we can change properties of our objects. And we're gonna be playing with this in a while when we start adding Mars, Mars objects here. But if I select the camera, for example, I can determine uh, what is the near plane and what is the far plane of the camera, how far you can see and other stuff. So everything that we change in terms of properties of the objects, it's gonna be here on the right in the inspector. We also have the project. This is where we keep our assets. So if you have like lots of textures, 3D modules and everything, but you didn't add them to a scene yet, they're gonna be here. So here's where we see our, um, uh, our assets. All right, so given that I installed Mars here, I'm gonna have a couple more options that you don't have if you didn't install Mars. I, uh, I can see here, for example, that I have this Mars tab and a lot of buttons here. We're gonna see what the majority of them do. One thing that I usually do is click in here on Mars and then uh, uh, build settings check. This is gonna tell me if I have everything that I need to build this project. So here it's telling me that I do. So my Unity version is supported. Uh, I do have AR Foundation, I have AR Core because I'm gonna use uh, Android. So this is a good thing to check. If there is something wrong with your project, it's gonna tell you like, well, you don't have a uh, correct version of Unity, like you're using 2018, so it's not gonna work. 
or maybe you don't have uh, AR Foundation installed, so you just need to install that. So this is a good thing to check before we start. And now let's start with that. So first thing is, uh, in Unity, we do have this camera, which is a virtual camera, right? So if your application is not AR, if your application is VR, you definitely want to use this camera. You definitely need this camera. But in our case, I want to have access to the camera in the device, in the mobile phone or in the HoloLens or in whatever we are working with. So we're not gonna be using this camera. Instead, we're gonna be right-clicking Mars and creating a Mars session. So the Mars session is the object that is gonna handle the entire AR session in this application. So it's gonna enable the camera, get the data from the camera and everything. So we're gonna see that if I just click this guy here, Mars session, it already removed the camera, the original camera that I had. And as a child of the Mars session, I have now a main camera here. So this main camera is very similar to the other one. The only difference is that this guy has a Mars camera component, which is gonna track and give me the information about, about the real world um, the real world camera. All right, so that's it. We have a couple of things here, not super important. Now let's see why Mars is interesting, why Mars is nice. So say for example, that I wanna place an object in a table, like in the tabletop. How can I do that? With AR Foundation, I would need to write lots of codes to try to identify that something is a table, right? In Mars, we work with something that is called a proxy. So a proxy is basically a set of conditions that define something in the real world. So if I wanna define, for example, every single vertical surface, this can be a proxy. Every single table, this is gonna be a proxy. Ever, like the floor, it's gonna be another proxy. So how do we create proxies in Mars? We go here to window, Mars, and then Mars panel. This is gonna open every single option that we have for Mars. And we have a proxy object here. So the proxy object is, is the most generic, the more generic way of creating a proxy. If we just click on this, we will need to set up every single condition. But in the top here, we have presets. So presets is basically Unity telling us uh, a couple of useful things. Like, well, I, I often we want to use horizontal planes or vertical planes of masks, face masks if you wanna make a face filter, for example, or image tracker, uh, tracker as I said, what the image uh, marker is in the beginning. So let's start, for example, here with an elevator surface. So I wanna detect every single elevator surface in my, uh, in my real world. So I'm just gonna click here. It creates a proxy for me, which is this elevated surface. surface. And then we have the Mars options here. So Mars options, they are divided in conditions, actions, forces, and settings. Condition is basically what do I want in terms of features to detect this surface and identify that this is something that I want. So here we have uh, two different conditions. The first one is the height above floor condition. So it's telling me that the ideal height is 1.5 meters, but, as I said in the beginning, this is smart. This is like basically uh, uh, fuzzy. So it tries to be as smart as it can, it can be. We have here the ideal, but there is the range here from the ideal. So it can go up and down a little bit by two meters in this case. So two meters seems to be uh, quite a lot. Like, so if I start with 1.5 plus two, it's gonna be uh, 2.5. So maybe that's too much. Maybe I just wanna like 0.5 here as a, a range. So this is the first condition, height above floor. And the second condition is, is plane. So it needs to be a plane. I don't want it to be a face, for example. I don't wanna place anything on my face, even though my face is above floor. So we have those two conditions here. And then in actions, we have what I want to happen when I define or when I find this condition. So the first one is show children on tracking action. So it means that everything that I add as a child of this proxy is gonna be instantiated in that place. So if I have, I wanna have, for example, uh, a flower pot in, on the table, I can just add that as a child here. So if I create, for example, this cube and it is big, let me make that a little bit smaller. 
One thing that is interesting to note here is that this is in meters. So basically I'm telling here that this is gonna be 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So every time that I find this elevated surface, the action, the first action is uh, show children on tracking action. So it's gonna enable this cube. And if I'm not tracking anymore, like I'm not able to see the surface anymore, it's gonna just remove that. It's, it, it's, it's, it's going just to, uh, to uh, disable that. So I'm not seeing the surface. I don't wanna see the, the, the children anymore. The second action that we have in here is the set pose action. So this is basically, it's gonna track the position and the rotation of the proxy every time. So if I rotate the table, for example, this thing rotates as well because I wanna face and I wanna match with the surface. So that's it. It's quite like abstract here. We are creating this elevated surface. We could, for example, just go here to Mars and then panel and create uh, just horizontal plane. So every single thing that is, in, uh, that is an horizontal plane is going to be tracked. We can determine what is the alignment Given that I said it's horizontal, then I have here a condition, which is horizontal up, like it's facing up, it's the floor or the top of a table, not the ceiling, because the ceiling is also a horizontal plane, but it's facing down. So it would be horizontal down here and then it go. And say, for example, well, I don't want it to be placed in small planes, for example. We can add a new condition here and say that I want a plane size condition and just determine in between what sizes I want. So the minimum size, for example, is 0.5 meters or maybe 0.3 meters. I don't know, we can determine that. And we can add a, a maximum size if we prefer. But those are the conditions here. Uh, as I said, we can use geolocation. So we can, for example, use a geofence here and say that I only want it to happen if this is a plane with this size in San Francisco, for example. Well, I won't be able to test it, so I'm gonna remove it for today. But you know that we can have this geofence condition that's gonna allow you to use geolocation as well. All right, so this is the first thing that Mars allows us to do, which is basically define our workflow, like where I want to place things and how I want them to be oriented. This is the first thing. Uh, we're gonna see a couple more options here, like the new tools, as we said, like they added a couple more interesting things, like the proxy rules. I'm gonna show what this is. But the second thing is I wanna be able to test it, right? So in every single horizontal plane, I want to uh, place this cube, which is big. Let me make that cube a little bit smaller. And I want it to be aligned to this plane. So this represents my plane and I want it to be on top of that plane, right? So I said that we can test it without building and going on site. How do we do that? There are two different ways. The first one is we can go here to window, Mars, and then select the simulation view. And in the simulation view, we can select a couple of predefined environments that you need to just build for us. So we have this backyard, we have the bedroom, we have the museum, we have the office, and we can bring our own environments here. I'm gonna show you guys how to do that in a while, but uh, let's say I wanna test this thing in the bedroom. Where is the bedroom here? Bedroom. So look at that. If uh, I was testing this in the real world, it would place my cube in the bed. Why is that? Because the bed is a plane, it's horizontal up, it's facing up, and it's bigger than 0 0.3 and 0 0.3. So this plane is bigger than, is, it, it has more than 30 centimeters uh, here and here. So that's why this was placed there. And then, uh, well, I can just assume this is gonna work on the real world as well. But the thing is, that's not how things work in real, in, in real life. The device needs to map the entire environment, right? So the simulation view just uh, assumes that everything is going to be smooth and we're gonna find that immediately and this is where my plan was placed. If you wanna have a better sense of how this is gonna perform in real world, what we can do is basically, instead of using the simulation view, go to Mars and then select the device view. So the device view, when I hit play, it simulates that I'm looking through the camera and that I am moving around. So you can see here that it takes a while 
for the plane to be instantiated, for the plane to be find, uh, found. So if I hit play here, I can just move around and now it appears. And this is the first plane that I saw. So now it was placed on the floor, not on the bed, because I was looking to the floor and it matches the conditions. So now I, I, I might say, for example, well, this is a problem. I don't want it to be instantiated on the floor. I only want it to be instantiated on the, on the bed. So we need to change the conditions in a way that it doesn't fit with the, um, that it doesn't fit with the, with the floor. There's one thing that I like a lot here is that we, if we identify that there is this bug, like, well, I don't want it to be placed on the floor. We can go back to the simulation view and try to understand why this was a match, like why this thing was matted. Then here in the inspector, we have this option, which is comparing simulation view. And then it's gonna tell me every single plane, everything that is green is a possible plane. So it was instantiated here in the bed, but it could have been instantiated in the floor or in this, this desk. I don't know if it's called a desk. Yeah, I think it's a desk. Or here on top of this other thing, this, this wardrobe here. And now I know that, well, there are potentially lots of planes here. And then if I hover, it tells me why. So we can see here in this area that it says, well, this is a plane, so it passes. This is a line up, so it passes and the size passes as well. And if I wanna optimize, like I only want it to be placed in this plane, I can select this plane. And then I have here the optimize, uh, oh, so if I click it, it's gonna optimize all of my conditions so it matches only the, the bed. And then if I go there again, comparing simulation view, uh, yeah, 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 optimize all, want to confirm our conditions match the select data, yes. Uh, it's still getting this plane here. So we need to change it a little bit better. Uh, maybe for the max size, right? So we can add the, the max size and say that I want it to be maximum of a uh, three, for example, because my floor was bigger than that. So we can uh, fine tune our conditions in a way that uh, it works uh, better there. Cool, cool, cool. So that's what we can do in the workflow, like while we were testing and we can test in multiple, in multiple views. We saw here that this thing, like this horizontal plane was only instantiated in a single time, right? It only appeared like in the first plane that it found. And this is because by default, the proxy is matched only once. If you want to have this proxy matched multiple times, we need to create, uh, to create a proxy replicator. So a proxy replicator is based on an object that we can make a proxy a child of it, like I have the proxy replicated and then my horizontal plane here. And we can say how many of those we want to have. So I want to have up to three. Now, if you go back again to the simulation view, we're gonna see that we have three here, exactly three, because we could find three different planes that match our conditions. And then we max that out to three here. So before I move forward with this thing, let me go back to the chat, given that I am not seeing everyone, just to make sure you guys are seeing it. How's the resolution? It's good, good. Is the Mars folder created after the installation of Mars? Yeah, exactly, Dale. When you install Mars, it just creates everything that you need. Uh, Jerry, just touch up on your question. Ah, yeah, I just did that, all right. Cool, let me see if there's something. Ha, uh, okay, I think that the, the questions that are in the questions tab, I can uh, answer them later, but up to now, it seems that everything is, is going fine. All right, so let's see what else we can do here. We know that we can create proxies, so we have lots of uh, different options here that optimizes our workflow. We can create the, the replicators, we can, uh, we can do those, those things. One other interesting thing that we can add to proxies is what they call forces. So uh, force is basically like a behavior that I wanna add to that specific object when it's instantiated. So I can, for example, make this be aligned to the camera. So now it's gonna be always aligned to the camera. It's gonna be looking to the camera. 
if I move it around. So this is good, for example, for interfaces. If I want, for example, a panel to be looking into the camera every time, I don't need to implement that, like in code. I just need to create the force and clear and create this alignment force to the camera. And actually, it can be aligned to every other thing, not necessarily the camera. You can add any other thing here. So you can make, for example, one prox always look to the other proxy. And we have the conditions uh, that we can add. We have lots of interesting forces. You guys can explore them later. One that I like a lot is this uh, occupied region. If we add that, it's going to create a boundary here. And nothing else is going to be instantiated in this same boundary. So if you don't want, for example, two objects to, to occupy the same space, you can just add that. And then this force is going to move them around. You can determine here uh, uh, what is the size of the region, like what uh, the region looks like. But that's what this thing does. So those are more options, more properties in there. And now the. Entering into the, so this is like the basic workflow for Mars, like what we can do, we can test, we can experiment, we can add forces, we can have, we can add uh, geo, uh, geo fences if we want to. And now the first new tools that Unity Mars introduced, the first thing that they added uh, recently, this is called the um, proxy rule set. So how does this thing work? It helps us to define more complex behaviors for our uh, proxies uh, in, forms of, in, in terms of rules. So if I click here, for example, add rule, I can select, for example, for every single horizontal surface that exists in the scene, I want it to do something. So for example, I want to add some content. And then I can select what object I want to respawn. So I want, for example, to respawn this, this gallon here every time that I see a different horizontal surface. And then we can select here where in that area we want it to be instantiated. So we don't need to calculate anything. So we can add the centroid, for example. And what is the centroid? It's basically like this. It, it's, it tries to define the center. But if we have more than objects in a proxy group, it's going to be the center in between all of those. Uh, usually what we use is the closest something. So we can use, for example, the closest point in that, uh, in, in that proxy from the camera. So it's going to instantiate that in the closest point of the camera. Or we can randomize the position as well. So we can randomize uh, in, in between uh, the boundary rect of that specific thing. So if I want, for example, every time in every proxy, uh, add that to a different position uh, in the plane, I can do that. So it's not going to look like always the same thing. If I want, for example, to add lots of different frames on the wall, for example, they can be like a little bit different uh, relatively to other things. So in this case, from the camera, but it could be another object. So we can add, add that for every. We can add that to a particular one. So we can select like exactly what proxy I want to be here in the rule. And I can add the conditions. Or we can add to up to, and then I decide the number. So I only want this behavior that I added here for the first two. Oh, OK. So let, say, for example, I want to randomize the position, but only on the first two that I find. So on the first two horizontal surfaces that I find. So we can just add those rules here, and we can combine them, like having multiple rules here. So this is one of the new things that they that they added. Actually, you can do everything that you do with the rules, just adding conditions to the proxies here uh, and forces to the proxies. So this is possible. But sometimes it becomes a little bit easier uh, when we use the when we use the, the proxy rules there. So this is just like one addition. It's quite new. I'm pretty sure that they're going to add more features soon to the rules. Like now it's super, super, super basic. But there are a couple of interesting things that might be uh, coming there. And the other new thing that they added, and this is impressive. If you guys haven't seen it yet, I think this is going to blow your mind. This is the companion app. So uh, we're going to send you the link if you want to install that as well. It's available for Android and for iOS. It's beta. So it's like an open beta now. You can install that. But Unity is actually uh, working hard on that tool. What the companion app is, 
Uh, well, one of the things that Mars is not doing for me here is interacting with the real world yet, right? So I need to build the application and see how it behaves and how it reacts to the, to the environment and, and to the real world there, right? So with the companion app, we can go here to Mars, companion project link, and scan this link, uh, this QR code to link the, the app and the editor. So let me show you guys here my mobile phone. This is just mirroring my mobile phone. Actually, it's not, it should be. Let me see why it's not. Ha <laughs> ha, mirror, mirror phone to PC. There we go, is it mirroring? Yeah, there we go, cool. So this is mirroring now. Uh, I have the companion app installed here. So in the companion app, you can actually create new projects and there are a couple of things that we can do. I'm gonna show you guys. Uh, and you can link the project to, to the editor. This is only possible if you, uh, if you are a Mars user. So during the 45 days, you can actually do that. But after that, uh, you can still use the companion app, but not link that automatically to the editor. So we just scan this thing. I did that already. And then we're gonna have this companion resource manager here. So this is gonna allow me to use my mobile phone to track things in the real world. And then I bring them into here. There are lots of things that we can do with it. The two things that I like the most is, the first one is I showed you guys that in the simulation view, we can use different environments here, right? We can like test in different mock environments. If I wanna test in my real environment, I can use this. So this is my project, Unity Mars Workshop. Uh, oh, let me see here if you guys, can you guys see what I'm seeing there? The companion app. Can you guys see the, the screen being mirrored? All right, great. Uh, okay, cool, cool. So uh, we can create, I, I, it's probably tiny for you guys, but we can create a couple of things here. So for example, I wanna create an environment. So I'm gonna click on the AR capture mode. Then I have the environment. And then I will start scanning my room. So you guys can see that this thing is basically scanning my room. And then I am just capturing it. And I click on, uh, on the corners. So I'll place the corner here, the corner here. It's not perfect. I am sitting down, so it's quite difficult. But say for example, well, this is my, oops, this is my environment. So now I can just save that at something. So, well, untitled environment is fine. And it's gonna save it. Like it's gonna capture everything that I did in here. And now I have one environment here that I can sync with Unity. So now this is, that this thing is synced, I can go back here, uh, click on sync, and it's gonna download my environment. So I just click here on download and I save it. And now I have that environment that I can use to uh, represent my room. So look at that, this is super nice. So this is basically the thing that I scanned, right? So we can use that to scan the entire room. Of course, you guys will need to be more patient than I was here, like actually scan everything and create the, the boundaries in the correct place. I didn't do that, but you guys can definitely do it in, in when you are uh, uh, well when you are playing with that and and experiment with it. But basically, what this thing does is generate one environment for us that we can use in that uh, in that in that uh, in the simulation view. The other thing that I like a lot is the proxies. So I was here trying to create the the proxy that only gets the bad right. So I created that, I created lots of conditions. A better way of doing that is actually just using the companion app, creating on a, uh, clicking on AR cap, uh, capture and creating and, and clicking on uh, proxy scan. So it's, for example, scanning here now my, my room. Well, I scan more than, I, than I, I would need. So let me try that again. I, I, I want the, the couch, for example. So I can just proxy scan and point to the couch. It was more than the couch. Anyways, uh, let's assume this was just what I would like to capture. We pause that and then I can save that. Ah, you can even test, like you can test uh, how a 3D object would be placed in that specific uh, proxy and we can 
adjust those things. And then I can confirm and save it. So now I will save this. So it was saved. Oh, it was saved as a scene. I don't think that's what I want, is it? I think, what did I do wrong? Oh, no, that's fine. I just called that uh, untitled scene. It's OK. So now if I go here again to the companion app and click on uh, the sync button, it's going to refresh the list. And now I have this, uh, this environment here, which is my proxy. So I'm going to save that. Uh, it has the same name. So let me call that something else. And then uh, here, if I click on the open scene, it's going to open the specific scene that was created with that proxy, with my proxy. So look at that. I have the proxy here, the proxy that was scanned. And it's going to have lots of different conditions that already exist based on it, what, it, what it scanned. So it has the size condition. So it's basically the size of the, the thing that I have scanned. It does have the horizontal up here. So if I want, for example, to use a different proxy, let's create one that is for the wall, for example, because the wall is actually, they are capture modes. The wall is a, a vertical one. So let's see. I'm going to click on start, and then it's scanned. And I will pause that. And save it. I don't think it saved it. Did it? The interface is a little bit confusing. Yet. Like I, I'm not 100% sure. I don't want to. OK, tap to create. Oh, there we go. There we go. So I didn't see this the other time. But basically, what I have here is uh, a couple of things that we can that we can change. Like if you want to precise it. So it, te it tells me the, the mean and the maximum size. It tells me the, the alignment, so horizontal down. I don't think this is correct, is it? It should be uh, vertical. So I can just change here to vertical, for example, and then uh, that's it. We can add traits. The traits can be, for example, for example, geometric traits, uh, uh, geofence traits, but I'm not going to add any. And then I confirm, and I think it's saved. Is it? Let's see. Yeah, it is. So we can go back here in that Mars Companion Resource Manager, uh, update it, and it's going to bring here one new scene. This scene is going to have the new proxy that I have just created, and then I have the everything about it. So I think it's the first one on the list, actually. Let's see. Yeah, that's it. So. Uh, it says it says here mixed because a couple of the planes were not completely aligned. Like I have uh, parallel planes, but that that works. So this is like the minimum and the maximum that it detected, and there are lots of other different conditions in here that are based on what this thing saw in in the real world. And again, this is uh, useful not only because we can scan the proxies without needing to determine them here, but also because you can see how powerful the device that is going to be running it is. So actually, if you have like a device that is not as powerful as the one I have here, it's not going to find the planes this easy, all of those planes. Maybe it's going to suffer to find a couple of planes. So we relies on it, it seeing exactly what your device is able to see. So if you have like a Node Android that doesn't have uh, death camera, for example, you can uh, already understand that this thing is not going to see all of the features that maybe you are uh, looking for. So this is this is cool to see what is the power of your device as well. So if you have a HoloLens, you're going to see exactly what the HoloLens see. If you have the iPhone 12 Pro with a lighter, you're going to see exactly what this device sees. So basically, those are the new tools that they have implemented. This thing is super, super powerful and a game changer. So I'm really curious to see what else they're going to be uh, adding here. You can even capture like the animations if you want, like move the camera and capture that. I didn't see like a good use for this uh, for this yet, but uh, I showed the prox scan the environment, but they also have this uh, data recording. So this is going to record the path of the camera. So if you want to use that for simulation, it's going to record exactly 
what your camera did, and then you can use that simulation here to see how the user would see that as well. And there are a couple more things. Um, the other one is the marker. So if you want to create an image marker uh, in an easy way, you can just click here on marker creation. Then you take a picture of something, and then you place uh, what we, would be the markers in that specific image. So later on, you can just uh, instantiate things in, in on top of that marker. So this is another thing that they have in there. So they have been adding like lots of tools here that can make our life a lot easier to prototype and to and to to test. Uh, but yeah, those are the new things that they that they added. I think this covers everything that I would like to show today. Like what is possible to do this thing. Uh, let me see here if. I should invite Steph back if there is a question that I can fix just now. Uh, what the phone is that? This is an iPhone. It's an iPhone 12 Pro. Um, ba -ba -ba. What's the mirror app? The mirror app is called A Power Mirror. Okay, okay. You might want to obscure the credit cards. Oh, <laughs> yeah, those, those don't work. So yeah, that might be a good idea, but I don't think that's that necessary. They just don't work. But thanks for letting me know. All right. Uh, yeah. So I will invite Steph back just to wrap it up. And I will come back to uh, answer all the questions that are in the questions tab. And if you have more questions, I will be glad to answer all of them. Wonderful, Jerry. Obrigado. Thank you so much. So Jerry's uh, our uh, Brazilian lead here. Um, hence my little obrigado sharing there. But Anne, thank you very much for catching that. Really do appreciate it. And thank you all so much for tuning into this workshop here. As Jerry was mentioning, I'm going to take about five minutes to just wrap things up quickly before Jerry joins us and answers some of the questions in the questions tab. There's a lot of them. So thank you all so much for tossing in some questions. I'm really excited about the Q&A session coming at the very end here. Now, for those of you who are still uh, around with us. I'm going to toss in a poll here asking you, on a scale of 0 to 10, how likely are you to recommend this workshop? 0 being you wouldn't recommend it to anyone, 10 being that you did find it useful for learning more about Unity Mars. So I'm going to toss in the poll here. It really helps us understand whether or not we should continue working or doing these free workshops and webinars covering some certain topics or more advanced topics. So please do let us know on the polls tab there. How likely are you to recommend this workshop and webinar? It helps us out a lot and uh, really would appreciate it. Thank you. So with that, Dan, our head of marketing here, did shout something out in the chat, a special announcement that we have. So this Friday, February 12th, we have our first happy hours. So Dan, if you're still around here, feel free to toss in the link there. Uh, the happy hours will just be a, a, an opportunity, a platform for anyone to join in on, ask questions about the industry, really just chatting with each other, bouncing ideas, setting up uh, more of an idea of what we can expect the industry to look like, what questions you may have around AR and VR. So feel free to join us this Friday for our first happy hours session. It's one hour, as Dan was saying, Wild West, ask me anything session with our instructor and developer, Cash. We would love to have you with us there. If, uh, if all things go well, we plan to host these at least every two weeks, maybe even the week following. But a great opportunity for you to pop in and really just chat about the industry and any questions, ask us anything about the world here. Now, we did fly through the content quite quickly. Um, and again, you will all receive the recording to, to review later on at your own time if there was something that we missed. However, I do want to share some stories of some students that we've had with us. If you are looking to take this to the next level or to join us to upskill yourselves, work on a project, or continue working on something you've already been developing for. Uh, we've had the pleasure to have Mike Oaks with us in one of our courses uh, about several months ago, a year back. And after taking the Circuit Stream course, he has now landed a position and job with Unity. And we've had several members and our alumni take our course, work on a project that one-on-one -on -one private sessions all of our students get each week. And 
use those projects to apply to Oculus's Launchpad program and get accepted, receive $30,000 grants to continue working on their ideas and projects with the support of Oculus. And we had Matt Delalo host one of our information sessions with my colleague, Kyle, you may have seen in the chat. Matt took our circuit stream course and is now working with Lucky VR, creating very cool casino and gambling experiences. For some of you who are familiar with Poker Stars, he works with Poker Stars VR as well. So lots of different people coming from all walks of life to either upskill, get jobs, create something that they have a passion or interest for, and we would love to have you with us. Now, for those of you who may have marked yourselves as a, you know, a one, two, three in Unity in terms of experience, we do have our beginner intermediate friendly XR development with Unity course. This is 10 weeks long, four hours per week. Three of those hours are in class with an additional one hour private session. And what this course will cover is how to use Unity to create VR and AR projects and applications, the fundamentals of C-sharp coding, and again, weekly one-on-one -on -one support on your own project and idea as we match you with the best mentor that we have for your specific interests. Now, the full price of the course is $39.50. The next available date to register to is April 27th. We hold it every two, two and a half months, so lots of opportunities to join us. And just recently, we announced a VR starter pack for future registrations and enrollments, which includes our 10-week course, a C-sharp scripting fundamentals program, and an Oculus Quest 2 headset to send out. And if you're interested in taking, let's say, that intro to XR design course, after taking the longer program, we do have a starter pack plus that might be of interest to you. Now, what can you expect to learn um, in this course? Again, uh, it's, it's using Unity to make VR and AR apps, C-sharp fundamentals and scripting, four hours of class per week over 10 weeks, and that one-on-one -on -one support each week, private sessions to work on your projects together. Now, there's no experience required, so beginners have no fear. We welcome everyone from all walks of life. And typically, a Mac or a Windows computer will do just fine for the program, though PCs and Windows are better tailored towards it. If you, some of you, own an Oculus Quest here, if you're looking to connect your Quest to your computer to actually see what you've created in Unity, that is currently only available for Windows unless you boot camp your MacBook. But either way, a Mac or Windows works to work with Unity and to develop experiences. And if you're looking to do a mobile experience for AR or VR, an Android or an iPhone will work just as well. And again, any device you're looking to build for, we would love to support you with that. Now, for those of you who are more experienced than Unity and C Sharp, really looking to take it to the next level, learn some more in-depth topics and get weekly support on your project as well. We have our XR Project Accelerator program. This next course starts on March 1st. The deadline to register is a week before that. The full price of this is $44.50. It's eight weeks long, five hours of class per week, three in class and two private sessions to accelerate any projects you're already working on or something new that you'd like to bring in and get support on with. Now we do have an accelerator pack here as well for this. It includes the eight week course, our C-sharp short course to brush up on your C-sharp skills and an Oculus Quest 2 headset to send out as well. We have the accelerator pack plus if you wanna add that intro to design course as well, really to get into the more design topics that is covered in the eight week but taken to the next level as well. Now, for both of these courses, we do have payment plans and financing options from three-month plans to six-month plans, and you can even split it up over the year each month through our 12-month payment plan. And if you're interested in just checking it out, feel free to download a syllabus at circuitstream.com learning or apply to one of our courses. Kyle or myself would be more than happy to chat with you, see what your goals are, if it's a good fit or not, and potentially have you with us. Now we do also have team training opportunities if there are groups of people looking to take this to the next level to learn how to create something themselves, work on a project together. We have these team training opportunities, custom content, custom schedule, 
really to work with you and your team. It is quite tricky to get everyone together during during this crazy time we're living in. But if you're interested, feel free to check that out as well. Now, again, myself or Kyle would be more than happy to chat with you if you have any questions about this industry or area, about our courses, workshops, anything. Feel free to reach out to either of us too, and we'd be more than happy to support you. Now, I would like to bring Jerry back onto the stage here. I do see we have a lot of questions in the questions tab to get to. Um, so with that, how we're gonna approach the questions here is I'm gonna start with the most uh, upvoted questions followed by uh, the oldest questions to the most recent. So go on here, I'm actually gonna remove my screen just so you guys can see us both clearly. And uh, in terms of upvotes, I have one here, Jerry, from, uh, from David. And David's asking, is there a roadmap for new features using Mars? Uh, well, I would say yes, but it's not public. They, they certainly have a roadmap, but it's not something that is uh, open there. So we just, right now we just wait and see. <laughs> but internally they probably have it. They just didn't make it public. Perfect, perfect. Then uh, here's another one from David. It got the most upvotes here. You, Jerry, do you have uh, recommended optimal hardware specs when developing for XR? I know we have our VR hardware requirements blog article. I will toss that into the chat for you, David, but feel free to touch up on that a little bit, Jerry. Yeah, that's a tricky question because it depends a lot on what we're doing inside of XR. Like if it's, it depends on the project, on the, on the nature of the project. But what I usually recommend to the students is getting uh, something that is at least compatible with the Oculus Link technology. Because if that's the case, it means two things. The first one that you're going to be able to iterate with uh, in the Oculus without needing to build. But also those are like mid range, not top notch, but like mid range, good quality computers. So they recommend, uh, uh, there is a, I can, I can get the, the, here in the chat, the link. So they, they, they say in this link, what works, like what are the GPUs that work with the Oculus link? And I always recommend like, well, if you can afford the best one, just go for it. If you can afford the, the first one that supports it, just go for it as well. It's gonna probably mean that you can do like the majority of the applications that we want. Like I started with one of those, like the first one that I got was the, 1060, I think, 1660 actually, which is like cheapest one that you can get and works well, those things. And it's like good up to now. Um, now I have a better one, but just because I I, I changed like to, to the laptop, but I, I could have been working with that one uh, yet. And it's like, in terms of GPU, it's quite cheap. So I would follow it that, like get the minimum re uh, requirements for the, for the Oculus Link compatibility. It's gonna ensure that you can work in the Oculus Quest with no trouble, but also that you can work with everything else out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. And I know a lot of people with Macs run into that issue connecting, you're using the link at all to connect their Oculus to the device, so. Yeah, they're very picky. Like there are, there are some uh, requirements in there. It's not like the most powerful thing ever, but they just, they're just picky. Like just a, a few uh, graphic cards, GPUs are gonna work. So mm -hmm. I would pick one of those and check the processor and everything that they're recommending there. But but yeah, I, I think that's like a good approach. Talking about hardware, it, it's like, it's impossible to have like one, only one answer and only one solution. It depends a lot of, you know, on, on your needs, on your budget, on what is available where you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's it's quite hard, but I try, to, I try to keep it closer to what is compatible with the Oculus Link. It ensures that I can iterate uh and i can make it work like most of the applications that we want to build it's going to be we're going to be able to build that this way mm -hmm. perfect now we have a question here from lisa lisa thanks for the question does mars offer any unique tools for creating location-based ar experiences unique tools for creating a location based uh well i wouldn't say they are unique because to create location based basically what you need to have is the access to the gps coordinates uh you do have what they call traits like geo traits in in mars and that's cool you can define for example what is the extent of the of the coordinates like well i want it to work 
only in this specific area that goes from this coordinate to that coordinate. And you can visualize that in a good way. So yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's like unique to Mars, but it does help. Like there are a couple of uh, things in there that help. Like you don't need to calculate uh, the boundaries, like what is inside of this area. If I want to define, for example, well, this should work only in Calgary. What does that mean? Well, it means a minimum and a maximum latitude and longitude. So what you need to do is, is calculate those things. In Mars, that's calculated automatically. So you just mm -hmm. need to, 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 to add those in the editor. So yeah, it helps, it helps. But Perfect. it's not like anything uniquely good, but, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Awesome, then we have one from, uh, from B Terway. So he was asking concerning Mars proxies, Jerry, does it also make use of LIDAR to detect table surface or walls? Yes, yes, it is. So um, if you are using Unity Mars, Unity Mars is using AR Foundation and your, your AR Foundation is using either AR Kit or AR Core. In case of the LIDAR, given that it now it's only available on the iPhone, it's gonna use AR Kit. And yes, you have access to all of the information that comes from the LIDAR. So it's gonna use that to map the environment. So if you only use plane uh, proxies with planes, as we're doing, uh, we're doing here, it's gonna uh, find uh, better and more accurate planes and faster. One thing that I can compare, like I have this iPhone 12 Pro and I have an Android, like a simple Android here. This phone doesn't find vertical planes, like it never finds walls because my walls are all white, so it's not able to, to tell where it starts and where it finishes. So using this phone, it never finds any wall. If it, it, it finds the, the floor, if I insist a little bit, because I have like a carpet, so it just knows where things are, but it never finds walls. With the iPhone, it finds the walls immediately. Like even though everything is the same, it's white, it just finds all of the walls. Mm -hmm. So yes, it uses wherever the provider, which is AR kit or AR core is seen. So if, if the phone has, for example, a depth camera, it's gonna give that information. If it has like infrared camera, it's gonna use that information. If it's a lighter, it's gonna use the lighter. So yeah, definitely. And one thing that you can add on top of that is meshing. So if you do have a lighter, you don't need to use only planes. You can use meshing, which is basically attacking the entire surface. And that's amazing. Like, well, maybe I can show in a while how it works, but that's like, that's super, super cool. But yeah, it, it uses whatever is available in the, in the mobile device. Perfect. Awesome. Great question. Great question. And Aileen, good to see you. A question from Aileen. How does AR Foundation work with Unity Mars, if, if at all? Uh, yeah, it, it definitely works. Like basically Mars uses AR Foundation. So when you say, for example, uh, I, I'm creating a proxy, which is basically defining that I want a plane that is vertical up. How does Mars know that? It just asks AR Foundation. Well, give me all of the of the planes in there and tell me the, the features of that plane. And this is our foundation doing that. So basically uh, you can think of uh, Mars as a layer on top of our foundation. So everything that we are doing in Mars is basically an abstraction, a set of tools that make it easier to query things in our foundation. So they work together. It's just mm -hmm. like one abstraction. If you wanna implement something that Mars doesn't do, like, well, Mars doesn't have this feature, but I know that I can get that from our foundation. Just go for it. You can definitely write your custom scripting there, your custom behavior, and you have access to everything. You cannot have a project in Mars without importing AR Foundation. Like they okay. basically work together. Yep. Very interesting. I had no idea. Great question, Eileen. That's awesome. Uh, so one here from Stu. Stu is asking, as far as importing outside objects into an AR environment goes, is there a preferred 3D object type to use? Yeah, so I prefer FBX always. It's the format that works the best with Unity and it brings animations and materials mapped and everything. So you can use objects like OBJ. You cannot use Max, you need to convert. So Unity is gonna work with the, with the open formats. So Colada, DAA, uh, I don't know, FBX, so OB, uh, yeah, objects. So most of them work, but usually FBX works better. So I, I always recommend people to use FBX because it's proven to work quite fine, but you can have like lots of different, um, lots of different uh, formats in there, not mm -hmm. proprietary form. So you cannot import, for example, the Max or Maya or CAD, something like that. You need to convert those first, uh, but yeah. Perfect. 
Awesome. Thanks for, for the insight there, Jerry. And then one, uh, one from Dale Campbell. Great, it's great seeing you again, Dale. So Circus Stream has a server that you can put your classwork on and allow friends, family to preview and test their content. Two questions. Doesn't Unity Mars content work on the server for testing? And are we allowed or able to upload Apple content onto the server as well? Yeah, so for the first question, uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> you can upload the Mars content in there. It's going to work as well. Like it's an APK in the end. It's basically uh, it's basically uh, an app as any other app. So you can finally upload that. For the second question, no, that's not possible because Apple is a little bit more restricted on well, how you publish uh, mm -hmm. apps to that. So you need to either publish that to the App Store, like everyone has access to it, or you need to create an, uh, a, a testing app that goes on, on TestFly, test flight, which is basically an app from Apple as well. So Apple is a little bit more tricky. You cannot just distribute things the way you want it to, to do. So uh, the platform cannot publish that. But for Android, that's, that's okay. Even with Mars, that, that should be okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Great question, great question. Now, one here from uh, Muad. Uh, Muad's asking, would you say the Unity Mars has the best geo-based AR options? Um, best geo-based AR option. That's a tricky question, but I would say I would say that I don't think there's like best or, or, or worse because it relies on the, the device that we have and the, the quality of the GPS. So it doesn't matter what is the tool that we're using, what's gonna determine if it's a good deal based uh, application or not is the quality and the update rate of your GPS. Mm -hmm. So if you are in using trying to use GPS internally, for example, inside, uh, you're going to have like some troubles. You're going to have less precision, but if you increase the precision, then you drain the battery. So there are a couple of problems in there, which are not necessarily linked to the, to Mars or other tools. So I would say that Mars is great for making geolocate, uh, geo-based ARs, AR applications, just because it has like lots of tools in the workflow. It makes easier to alter the content and you can also def uh, determine defenses like without needing to program those things. So I would I would say it's good, but the best one I don't think there is a best one. Like all of them rely on 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 the GPS and and yeah. So I don't know. It's yeah. it's good. It's it's really good, but I, I'm I'm not able to tell if it's the best. <laughs> makes sense. Makes sense. Perfect. Uh, let's see. Then we had another one here from Muad, but I'm not too sure if you're familiar with the artist that he's talking about. And if we can't answer this right now, we'll be sure to dig into it for you. But Maud was asking, any idea how Cause, the artist, made his geo-anchored sculptures with that accuracy and scale? I'm not sure if you're familiar with him or not. I am not. Mm -hmm. I'm not. But I think I can try to guess. Like, I will find the videos and see what uh, he does and, and how, and I can get back to you. But I would say he's using world anchors. So uh, he's probably using lots of techniques, like different techniques, but in AR core, you have something called world anchors. So you basically can anchor something in the real world based on the GPS information. So I would assume he's using world anchors, but I cannot affirm, I would need to, to research a little bit. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, well, we'll look into that for you, Muad. Or if you have a, something, a video to share, toss it into the chat, that way we can take a look at it today. Uh, yeah, you. yeah, that would be great. Perfect. So we got the upvoted ones, I believe. Let's see, not answered here. So there's a few that are kicking around. Let's go from uh, Eric Bubar. Eric's asking, presumably you can scan in an environment with an iPad LiDAR scanner and input the room and all of its items as a test environment as well? Yes, yes, you can, you can. Uh, that's one of the good things about the LiDAR. Like it, it's not only plane tracking, it's actually tracking the entire environment and all of the meshes in there. So you can do that, generate a 3D model with all the things in that environment and then bring that into a prefab that you used to test. So yes, that, that's mm -hmm. true. Perfect. It is such a strong tool, the, the LiDAR there. It, it is, it is, it is. Fabulous job. Um, 
So this is from David. Again, there's a couple here from David. We did touch up on the companion app, but he's asking, do we need a special app to mirror from Unity to our phones? And we, we had a few questions about that, Jerry. Was it the companion app that you were using and, and referring ah. to? OK, so uh, mirror from Unity to our phones. So that's not possible. So you need to actually build your application. Mm -hmm. What I was doing was the other way around. So I, I was mirroring from my phone to Unity. So I was doing two things here, and maybe that was confusing. So the first thing is I was scanning the environment and syncing the prefabs to Unity. That was the companion app. But I would like I would like to show you two guys while I was doing that. So I was mirroring the screen of my phone into uh, the PC, and for that I was using like another software, which is called A Power Mirror. But what this guy does, what this thing does, this A Power Mirror is basically just like streaming the 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 screen of my my device into uh into the software so i can capture that and you guys can see what i was doing because it wouldn't be able i wouldn't be able to show you guys like the screen this way so i was just mirroring that so two things happening here but what you described there like mirror from unity to the phone i didn't do that so actually you need to build the application to see mm -hmm. in the phone Interesting. Thanks for clearing that up. I know we had a few questions around what were you using, how were you doing it. So makes uh, makes complete sense now. And then this one's from David as well. Just quickly, there is an added cost to the pro license for Mars. Correct? Yeah, correct. So uh, they have a subscription plan, and I can remember. I think it's fifty bucks if you decide to pay monthly, or six hundred bucks per year. Uh, they might have changed it. Make it more expensive or more cheap. So I'm not 100% sure. But if you go to the United Mars website, you're going to see. But yeah, it's a subscription. So we have 45 days to try out and test and see everything. And it's like a f uh, open uh, access to, ev uh, to everything. So you can test like every single feature in there. And after the 45 days, you need to subscribe. Uh, and it was 50 bucks a month or 600 a year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, I do, I do know there's an added cost for the pro license and after the trial as well. Awesome. Now, uh, just uh, one from um, he, Kim, and my apologies if I mispronounced your name. Can Unity Mars go well with OpenXR? No, not yet. Uh, the thing is, Unity doesn't support OpenXR. So they plan that. There is an open blog where they say it's coming now in 2021, like beginning, mid 2021. So that might be the case in a couple of months, maybe until the end of this year. But right now, Unity doesn't support OpenXR yet. Mm -hmm. OK, that makes sense. So I hope that answers your question there. Um, awesome. Then a recent one here from Wilbert. Wilbert was asking, what can be done with session recording videos? Can it be used as the stimulation environment, simulation, my apologies, environment with proxies mapping to it? Yes, yes, exactly. I didn't test that myself yet, but that's exactly what the recording is uh intended to so it's not only video it's not only the video it's more than that it's actually it's recording all of the data in the environment so it's detecting the planes the feature points uh, everything that it can detect and you can actually play that later and see in the environment view like in, in the simulation view how the proxies are going to be mapped to it yeah you're you're absolutely right there that's the intent of this thing i didn't test it like myself but it's, it probably works mm -hmm. perfect awesome uh, one from Yinning. Yinning was asking, could we test Android app in Unity if we use Mars? As she remembers, AR Foundation could only test the application after build and run in the Android mobile phone. That's the same for Mars, actually, because Mars is built on top of AR Foundation. It's exactly the same. You cannot test uh, in the editor. Actually, you can test as I showed you, like with the simulation view, with the device view. So basically, you're simulating what's going to happen. But to see the image from the camera and scan, you need to build because it uses lots of the sensors that only exist in the, in the device. So you cannot see that in the editor, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, and then we have one from Eric, if you're still around here, Eric. For you, Jerry, are there any kind of low-cost controller options for phone-based AR that could allow you to manipulate AR objects with a controller as a form of a low-cost HoloLens, for instance? Are there any kind of low-cost controller options for phone-based AR? 
that could allow you to manipulate AR objects with a controller as a form of low-cost HoloLens. Well, yeah, you can use any Bluetooth div uh, controller out there. So you mm -hmm. can have like a Bluetooth controller. But the thing is, if we're using AR phone based, you are holding the phone already. So you only have two hands. You're gonna like hold the phone with one hand and hold the controller with the other one. I'm pretty sure this is not gonna work. Like this is gonna be uncomfortable and weird. So I have never seen that. Yeah, so it's possible, but I don't see like it being comfortable. If you find a good solution for that, let me know I'm interested in that. <laughs> so one thing that I was discussing with Nikisa a couple of uh, days ago is maybe if we can if we can make a device that is like a glass with a, sh with a couple of uh, mirrors that I can like hold the phone this way and map that to the glass, I could make my phone with the LiDAR into a HoloLens. The well, <laughs> thing is, the optics and the, and the mechanics of it, it, this is not simple, so we couldn't think about something, but an engineer might be able to solve that. If that's the case, if we can make this thing and use the phone as a HoloLens, then in this case, we can uh, actually use the controller. The thing is, even the HoloLens, they don't have controllers. We use voice control or hand gestures. So even hand gestures with the device is complex because you need to film your hand and that's, yeah, that's a little bit weird. But that's a good question. Like maybe it's possible, but the usability in there would be a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he just commented in the chat as well, like, maybe print a 3D headset, you know, through through a 3D printer of some sort. But yeah, I mean, good points there. Hopefully that helped you out there, Eric, a little bit. Uh, with that, we have a question here from BJ. And BJ was asking, what sort of additional sensor info were you referring to? I believe the Oculus Quest has a pretty rudimentary infrared camera. How would, how would view the real world through such a headset? Ah, that's a really good question. So uh, regarding the, the Oculus Quest, you can't. Like you really have a rudimentary pass-through camera and it's black and white, it's really, really bad. So it was not intended for AR. Uh, in an Oculus Quest, you definitely need to use that for VR. Like you don't see the real world, it's everything computer graphics. Uh, in, in the case of the other uh, headsets that are for AR, they there are lots of techniques in there, but usually they are they are transparent, like they are even translucent or transparent. And we have like a small projector or a small camera, a small projector. So it depends a little bit. So for the quest, it's not possible to use that for AR. And regarding the sensor, there are lots of them. So you have usually uh in the device in the mobile device you have a gyroscope you have an accelerometer you have the gps you have the cameras the cameras are sensors so they can be depth cameras with infrared they can be only color cameras they can be well the lighter so it depends there are lots of different types of sensors out there and it's gonna vary from device to device mm -hmm. perfect perfect uh we've got a few questions up uh, two questions one question left in the questions tab um, this one is from David. So also how does Mars differ to, oh, and I just clicked on the wrong one. <laughs> My apologies. But this was answering David's question that I was going to bring up. So David's question for you, Jerry, before we get into this that I posted is how does Mars differ from that of Vuforia? And then, uh, Teraway was just saying, as far as he knows, the difference to Vuforia and Unity's AR foundation. So you can deploy across all platforms, including the kit core Magic Leap HoloLens device with AR foundation. But tell us a little bit more about, and I'll just pop it open here, this. Your your thoughts on Mars differentiating from Vuforia. So uh, Mars and Vuforia, they're not the same thing. So you can compare Vuforia and AR foundation. They are like, basically they have the same goal, the same intent. If you know the differences between Mars and, and, and if you know the, the differences between our foundation and Vuforia, uh, basically, uh, Vuforia is, Vuforia is not free. Air foundation is free. Vuforia, uh, works in a different technique for, for detecting image. So you need to upload the image. It's not done on the device. So there are a couple of devices that are problems out there. Uh, AR foundation is gonna use AR kit and AR core. So it supports like more features that comes in, in those devices, but the Mars is something different. The Mars Mars is basically the the toolkit, the the set of tools that we have to use AR in a better way. So Vuforia doesn't have that. You don't have like in Vuforia, 
uh, any visual tools for editing anything to detecting proxies to intelligently placing things. So that's something that doesn't exist in Vuforia. It doesn't exist in AR Foundation as well. So Mars is on top of that. Mar Mars is a different thing. It's like one layer on top of those things. So if Vuforia, if Vuforia implements a tool that's going to do something similar to that, then we can compare it with Mars. But right now it's not comparable because they are like completely different things. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Hope that helps, David. Uh, and then last question that I see here in the questions tab, feel free to toss in any last minute questions that you may have for those of you who are still sticking around. But this one's from Terwe again. He's asking, what is the difference between Mars and Mars Pro? Because they are both eventually paid licenses. What's the difference between the two? Well, that's a good question. And being really honest, I don't think there is a Mars Pro. I don't think that thing exists, does it? Maybe. Oh. I know. And just... uh, no, 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 no. Okay. So actually, uh, Mars is only Mars. There's no Mars Pro. What might be confusing in there is the Unity Pro. So the Unity Pro is the, list, it's the license for the game engine. And the Mars is just Mars. So there's no thing as such as Mars Pro. Uh huh. That would we make... only have Mars. Yeah, we only have Mars. So the Pro, there is the Unity Pro license, which is 180, as someone did here. It's and amazing. Mars itself is 600. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. That makes sense. And yeah, I was I was thrown off a little bit too. Wasn't sure that there was a pro version of Mars, but and uh, I know what I think makes it confusing is that uh in order to use Unity Mars, you do need to have a Unity Pro version. <laughs> no. So yeah, what? you cannot use the Unity Mars in the personal uh in the personal version of Unity. So that's why things are together here. If you're buying everything for the first time, you need to buy like Unity Pro and Unity Mars. But for the free trial, you can try Unity Mars without the Pro subscription. Interesting. And I just saw a co comment from Lisa that you can use Mars with personal version. At least she does. Um, so, I mean, it, things would oh. add up if... Uh... Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can in terms of it, it's possible, but it's not legal. <laughs> so yeah, it's possible, but it's not legal. If you go to the terms of services here, it says a unit license is required to use Unity Mars. So, well, yeah, I might be wrong. I, yeah. Yeah. That's the case. So it works. It works. It's, it's just hush hush, right? Kind of like people using personal licenses. <laughs> Though they're making, you know, X amount of exactly. money. Exactly. Like it, it, it works. It's possible, but it's not according. It, it's not like agreeing with the terms of service. So right. So that's yeah. okay. I would pretend I didn't see it. Like I, I... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Use some what you don't. You don't use it. You don't use it. <laughs> Perfect. Um, question here from uh, Muad: Is there object recognition with Mars? Ah, uh, no, mm -mm. that's a good question, oh, yeah. but Are not you? yet. Be yeah, this is because uh, AR Foundation doesn't support it. There's no object recognition with, uh, oh, wait, no, I think I'm, I'm, I'm saying something that's not true. I think they did add that. Uh, one, one minute, let me just, let me just check this because I don't want to get, okay, yeah, they do support it. So AR Foundation does support uh object recognition i didn't test that in 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 a in mars so i would say it's not supported yet but it might be that i don't know how to use it but i would say it's not supported i didn't see it and i have been using mars for a while and i didn't see it so it, it is supported by ar foundation maybe they're gonna add that okay let me see here we have planes points we have this thing which is called synthetic object what this thing is Virtual object that is added to Mars system, like real world data. Yeah, I think, yes, I think it's supported. It's called synthetic object. I just don't know how to use it, but it seems like it's it's supported. Awesome. I'll check that. I will learn how to, how to use it and add that to the next workshop. Awesome, awesome. And Lisa did just share a link here. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for, for sharing that. We'll be sure to check it out. Uh, but I believe, and I'm just going through all the questions in the question tab, that those uh, are all the questions. But Lisa, you see, do you need to have a Unity license to purchase Unity Mars? Yes, a Unity license is required to use Unity Mars. Every subscription tier, including uh, personal, is supported. Perfect. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right. So actually, Who yeah, if you have a. <laughs> so it seems like yeah, it seems like it's not a problem. So if you, it seems like. If you have a, a personal license, that should be okay. Sure. Yeah. Well, I was I was Great. thinking because that if if you had to get the pro license of Unity and Mars on top, things add up. Like, 
it's it's not super appealing but you yeah. know thanks for, for sharing yeah that. yeah thanks thanks lisa that clarifies and that's true i'm just looking through it and it says yeah you can have a personal license mm -hmm. yeah. great. Mm -hmm. great 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 yeah i was i was concerned i was like well you know it's just not super appealing to get mars then if you have all these expenses on top of lisa thank you so much that, that helps a lot <laughs> clears up the air here um so with that you know i'm gonna take about one two minutes here for any last comments or questions that are coming in and then we'll wrap up this workshop again this is all recorded you'll be able to come back to it check out use the recording for any work you're doing and uh again we do have our happy hours this friday if you're interested in joining in ask us anything bounce ideas off of each other, learn more about the industry and trends. Uh, and we host these free workshops and webinars each week uh, until we have people saying they won't recommend it to anyone. So uh, let's see, we got David, we pretty much have to have a planned project so that the cost is worth it. Yeah, I, I would say so definitely. You wouldn't wanna pay for something and then not use it or you know, just not make the most of it. And then, oh, we got a question. Last question. He promises from Muad. Have you ever tried the scene recognition with Wikitube? No, no. So that's called, uh, yeah, I, I know what this technology is and I've tested that in Vuforia, for example, like the, the area target. And I tested that in Mars, not in Mars, but in your foundation using machine as well. But mm -hmm. I didn't use Wicked. Being honest, I never used Wicked in my entire life. And you know what? That's like one of the first tools ever that is like authoring tool for AR. It's like super, super old, but I never tested that. Like I never, I never tried it, but I, I will, I will, I will some, someday probably, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I haven't tested that. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Jerry. Great question. Muad. Uh, awesome. So with that, thank you everyone again for joining us on this workshop. It was a little more advanced going into unity Mars, Jerry, Thank you very much for your time today. I know it's getting quite late on your end down there in South America. So um, again, we do hope to have you all with us on future workshops, webinars, happy hours, courses, everything that we have to offer. Let us know. We'd be more than happy to chat with you to support you any way we can. Um, Mua, Deline, BJ, Terwe, David, Lisa, thank you all for, for joining, for being so active in the chat. Really do appreciate it. Um, and again, we're here to help with anyone, uh, anything that may come up on someone's mind. Do take advantage of these free workshops and webinars. Join us for a happy hour this Friday. Uh, but with that, you know, I'll, I will wrap things up. Jerry, thank you again for your time today. It's, it was an honor to have you with us. Um, and with that, I wish you all a wonderful afternoon, a great evening, a good morning if it's super early for you. But we do hope to have you with us again, and we're all here to help any way we can. I uh, wish you a wonderful, wonderful day, and thanks again for joining us. Bye.